so a few cases here, but this is a 26 year old with intermediate uveitis and episodes of vitreous hemorrhage um, in the right eye. Now, she comes in with this picture. What do you see here? Um, it looks like there's some vitreous haze. And? Uh, maybe those are some snowballs. Yeah, and then covered in the optic nerve. Um, it looks a little swollen. Right. Well, there's some neovascularization on the optic nerve. Nothing here. And geography shows uh, this. Looks like some NBD. Yeah. And kind of uh, leakage out peripherally, and the nerve looks a little pop. All right. This patient has intermediate uveitis. Is this vasculitis? Uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. So you can have vascular reactivity in the absence of true retinal vasculitis. So you can have retinal uh, vascular incompetence with leakage of dye into uh, the vitreous and into the retinal substance without really having true retinal vasculitis. Here's a 35 year old lady on cell set and prograph uh, dacrolimus for a kidney transplant. She has a history of member membrane of proliferative nephritis. Now she comes in with this. Ashley, what do you see here? Uh, I see what of the vasculature. Right. So, looks like sheathing, kind of, maybe, but not really. But then what do you do here? You do an angiogram and you see absolutely no leakage anywhere. So, is this vasculitis? No. This is chronic uh, vascular whitening without perivascular infiltration. So to truly have retinal vasculitis, you have to have perivascular infiltration. What's cuffing and sheathing? Sheathing is actually infiltration of the space around the vasculature in the adventitia, uh, infiltration with uh, leukocytes. So, right, so, so what that, did that though? So that was just chronic, uh, uh, a history of, uh, of uh, well, either the, one of two things, either retinal vasculitis or vascular insufficiency global vascular insufficiency with somebody with um, really is, is systemic hypoperfusion and therefore sclerosis of vasculature. So not all sheathing is very vascular infiltration. Um, retinal vasculitis is retinal vascular very vascular infiltration. Um, it is a common occurrence in posterior and intermediate uveitis, but in order for it to be the primary lesion so in order for it to be demarcated through retinal vasculitis, it needs to be the, uh, the, the primary lesion. It needs to be um, either an endotheliitis or uh, an inflammation or infiltration around blood vessels as the, as the initiating lesion. Retinal vasculitis can be primary, can be uh, and therefore focal. Uh, it can be localized with intraretinal hemorrhage. You can have local infarction, adjacent red, retinal exudation, or can be diffuse or secondary, which is what you see in intermediate uveitis, in which case you see diffuse capillary leakage, segmental staining of retinal vessels, optic nerve head, and macular edema. I like to call it inflammatory vasculopathy. You can distinguish it from retinal vasculitis. It's important to remember that even though we like to differentiate systemic vasculitis, uh, we like to look for signs of systemic vasculitis. Is Chris going to go? Alright, so, uh, that even though we evaluate for uh, systemic disease and systemic vasculitis, systemic vasculitis is actually truly rare. And in this cohort of uh, 1,430 patients from Oregon, with uh, ocular inflammatory disease, of which 14.1% had retinal vasculitis, only 11 or 1.4% of these patients had systemic vasculitis. So it's very rare. So we look for anchor, we look for uh, inflammatory mi microangiopathies, but we rarely find them. Is it 1.4% of the 14%? It's 1.4% of the 14%. Oh, so it's 241 and then only patients. <coughs> So uh, retinal vasculitis can have uh, 
very phlebitis, in which case it's primarily off the blood, off the veins, and it can be arteritis, as very well as it's primarily off the arteries, and everything in between. You can have a mix retinal vasculitis as well. Arteritis generally leads to you know, microinfarctions or large infarctions, sheathing, aneurysmal dilatation of the arteries, whereas periphlebitis can lead to sheathing uh, and cuffing, uh, where it's not influenced by branching or AV crossings. Uh, patients generally come in with blurred or painless loss of vision, floater, scatologia, uh, no symptoms with peripheral disease, often is the case. Uh, systemic uh, manifestations do include oral, skin, and genital ulcers, as you can see with the chest disease, arthritis, as you can see with uh, polyarthritis nodosa and with Wegner's. Not no called GP here, Wegner's was a Wegner was a Nazi for him to he, um, he injected people with as much oxygen as he thought they could tolerate in Poland. But anyway, so therefore we no longer call it Wagner, we call it granulomatous, gra granulomatous polyanthitis. Uh, neurologic disease, embolic disease also features with many systemic possibilities. Um, clinical characteristics, you have vascular alterations or an examination or an angiography, perivasculitis, 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 occlusive vasculopathy, and you should have, in most retinal vasculitis, signs of intraocular inflammation. Sometimes you won't really see it on, on examination. You have to make the patient look up and down and find these little spots of little vitreous cells, or just a little amount, trace amount of vitreous cell. Uh, but you can see CME, you can see papillitis uh, as a reactive phenomenon. Huh. I did not admit that. <laughs> 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 Sorry. So, and you can, uh, if you read, oh, wait. Ah. Go away. Hmm. <coughs> right. So, uh, primarily arteritis does include lupus, BAN, George Strauss, uh, HSV, BZB, and syphilis. These can cause primary, primar primarily arteritis. Lupus, I'll discuss this later, but really doesn't cause. Um, vasculitis so much as it does a vasculopathy. So you have to draw the distinction. This is a microangiopathy. Uh, primar primarily phlebitis includes sarcoid, eels, birdshot, not truly a vasculitis, but has a very strong vasculitic component, paraviral, toxo, and HIV. Combinations of arthritis and phlebitis do include MS, the Jets disease, and Wagner's. The last two are occlusive vasculitis. Vasculitides, sorry. There's many theories on mechanisms. Uh, most vasculitides are immune complex diseases or immune hypersensitivity reactions. Uh, direct antibody mediated vessel wall damage can occur as it does in lupus. Cellular immune responses direct damage by infectious agents. Uh, after all, ARN, uh, ORN, um, CMB retinitis, these are all retinal vasculitides with massive perivascular infl uh, infiltration. So uh, direction uh, damage by infectious agents is often seen. Tumor-mediated vessel damage disorder in immune regulation. There are ocular diseases, amongst others, uh, that occur without systemic, systemic disease. Eels disease is one such disease. Irvan, or idiopathic retinal vasculitis and neuroretinitis. Uh, frosted bronchitis and scleritis are all diseases. Uh, these are all vasculitic uh, inflammatory diseases uh, without systemic disease for the large part. Uh, a little asterisk on scleritis has a higher rate of association with uh, systemic vasculitis and other diseases too. This is a 38-year-old male with a positive PPD. All of the labs are negative. Past medical history is unremarkable, and he presents with a vitreous hemorrhage. Mm, Lee. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. Um, well, then looking at the total gestalt of the image, you can see that there's probably some um, what looks like possible sub level or hemorrhage along the, the inferior arcade right. of the vasculature. And also, there's a small area of hemorrhage. Uh, again, looks like it's deeper in the retina uh, along the, uh, the branch that's coming. So you have a pre retinal hemorrhage in front of the disc, in front of the uh, inferior arcade. And neovascularization is the most common cause for this. And uh, why does neovascularization occur? Increased VEGF load. Why does that happen? The peripheral or central non perfusion. And you see areas of non perfusion. Uh, you see peripheral non perfusion around here. Uh, but what's going on with these blood vessels here and over here? So they're, they're leaking, right? So you have leaky blood vessels, you have peripheral non perfusion and neovascularization in a gentleman with a positive PPD. Before we think about the diagnosis, um, We have a 47 year old Persian male with incidental findings on routine examination. He's PPD positive. Uh, what do you see here? A little vascular leakage off to the side, little microaneurysmal dilatation, and, and, and a little leakage from the disc here and here. So, Eels disease. Now, this is your quintessential isolated retinal vasculitis in the absence of systemic disease. Now, Viswas, who studies DB a lot, uh, thought of DB uh, DNA in vitrectomy samples of 41.6%. ERM specimens, when, when taken away, were positive for mycobacterium DB genome by PCR, uh, almost half of them. Uh, it's an idiopathic obliterative perivasculitis. It's neovascularization without vitritis, without uveitis, so the exception to the dogma that you know all retinal vasculitis has some stigmata of ocular inflammatory disease. And the strong association with uh, positive BPD. However, uh, you can, well, you can get all of these extractional retinal detachment, uh, Vision is usually pretty good. Vitreous hemorrhage is the most common cause of vision loss. Treatment involves peripheral laser vitrectomy for vitreous hemorrhage if immunomodulatory therapy is of no help and anti tuberculosis therapy doesn't help either. So it is thought to be a, uh, an immune response to the TB antigen uh, in patients who are previously exposed to the TB. Is it more characteristic to find them along the peripheral? It's usually peripheral. It's almost always peripheral. And that's, that's why it's usually asymptomatic. Usually patients have excellent vision until they come in with neovascularization and vitreous hemorrhage. The vitreous hemorrhage and neovascularization is usually central, whereas the ischemia is normally peripheral. Now, you'll see a lot of this in India, in Iran. You'll see a lot of this uh, in Asia, but very rarely in the United States, we you know, honestly, Al and I have only seen two cases. Is it usually it's or often bilateral. Oh. Um, That's not bad. But it's okay if it's unilateral. It's, okay. it's, okay. it's very often unilateral. Okay. It's actually usually unilateral. Okay. So here's a 34 year old lady with acute loss of vision and a better eye. Trace to interest cell was noted. In the interest of time, we'll just go through here. Uh, so this is, you can see some exudate around the retinal branches over there, and you see a little vitreous hemorrhage, maybe some old vitreous hemorrhage, um, and you see a little bit of sheathing, um, perhaps around here. Okay. Uh, similarly, in the nasal retina, you see the same thing, microaneurysmal, even microaneurysmal dilatation of these blood vessels, <coughs> exudation, and some vascular sheathing. 
over here you see these little bulbs, these little aneurysms, microaneurysms and macroaneurysms. You see vascular leakage, you see a little bit of uh, papillitis, it's a little leakage and obliterative peripheral vasculitis right around here at the site of this macroaneurysm. So any ideas? This, this, this is an isolated retinal vasculitis. Anybody? And if you don't know, that's fine. Because this is, there's more papers on this than there are patients. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is an entity known as Urban. Um, for some reason, they like to test you on this. So it's a rare condition with multiple saccular fusiform aneurysms of the larger retinal arterioles, peripheral non perfusion. There is always some UVAs. In younger patients, IMD doesn't work. Laser is sometimes useful, and it may regress rapidly. In some patients, without intervention, some patients develop fractional <coughs> retinal detachment. Um, once again, a really rare condition. But if you see this kind of thing in your boards, think about urban. So, neuroretinitis, which is often bilateral sacular dilatation, uh, and occlusive and this obliterative, primarily arterial vasculitis. So, occlusive. Yes. That, looking at that, it kind of looks like the difference is inflammation. Yeah. The, the first thing is that you have vitritis, which is important. The second thing is that you have neuroretinitis as well. Okay. So you can see the cystoid macular edema. Yeah. You can see the papillitis. And okay. you saw a little bit of vascular sheathing, which you can see in codes as well. Yeah. But not vitritis. Not vitritis. So this is a rather large topic, and we'll just kind of gloss over it a little bit. Um, this is a 76 year old. Lady, um, previously treated for a branch retinal vein occlusion by an outside retina specialist. Uh, she developed new symptoms in both eyes and also pulmonary symptoms. Um, she's anchor positive, she's ASIN lysocyte positive, and she has interstitial changes on her chest x ray. Uh, she has some vitritis. Uh, her vision is less than average. I don't remember what it was. Uh, what do you see here, Chris? Uh, so there's multiple kind of frosted vessels and then kind of peri uh, vascular hemorrhages all the way out into the far periphery. And it's largely peripheral bias, right? Right. Yeah. So you have peripheral bias, multiple peripheral, somewhat central pressure, complete inclusions, vitritis, a little bit of papillitis, and uh, intraretinal hemorrhage. So she was seen by this retinal specialist and, and, and laser was done uh, because of the uh, areas of non perfusion Similarly here, once we saw her, she had a lot of uh, retinal ischemia, some resolution of the phagophobitis, and maybe some macular atrophy, which you can see better on OCT. As we look at the angiogram, it looks pretty quiet, but there's areas of leakage peripherally. And here there's a close of vasculopathy. CME. This is a patient with an occlusive vasculopathy. Uh, this patient had Wagner's. Now, um, Positive, sorry, she has sarcoidosis, so uh, the, the candle wax dripping like vasculitis. That's what you should see in your picture. Now, we're going to have a whole lecture on sarcoidosis maybe on Friday, so I'm not going to go into the specifics of sarcoidosis, but this is what sarcoid vasculitis looks like. Vitritis, periphlebitis with this really pretty candle waxy appearance, is it attached to Bouget uh, appearance? Uh, sarcoidosis can cause a primarily venous occlusive vasculopathy. This is a, not my patient because I was three at the time, <laughs> but a 24-year-old white male with recurrent bilateral pan-UVA syndrome 
device, partially responsive to high dose corticosteroids, unremarkable, well, review systems with positive for recurrent ulcers, recurrent scrotal skin lesions, uh, painful elevated erythematous lesions, polyarthralgias and fevers, and a 35 pound weight loss. Vision sucked. Um, uh, there's bilateral retinal vasculitis, arteriolar attenuation, choroidal infarct, and retinal infarct. Now, this is the appearance one. We had a uh, really poor image of retinal. I'm sure happy you live when you do. <laughs> but you can see areas of retinal whitening, retinal uh, vascular occlusion. You can see little hemorrhages within the retina. It's treated with prednisone. Three months later, visual acuity came back to pretty, pretty good. Treated with cytoxin and calcium, once again, is all we had back then. They had back then, I wasn't alive. I was, but. So, lots of peripheral retinal whitening under, uh, when he recurs. So, what do you think this is? This is an occlusive vasculitis with multiple branch retinal arterial occlusions, skin ulcers, genital ulcers, mouth ulcers, um, <laughs> jet. So it's, it's, uh, it's Turkish, so the, the C with the little thing underneath, that's jet. So I don't know, so Turkish, it's not French. <laughs> but jet disease. So it's an occlusive vasculitis, as you can one of my patients. You can see peripheral and a loss of uh, circulation. You see uh, primarily an arteriolitis, vascular sheathing around the arteries, a lot of non-perfusion, and so many symptoms you can have if you elicit if you elicit a, a review system, you'll have buccal ulcers, dorm ulcers, you can have genital lesions, you can have uh, Inclusive vasculopathies of the gut. So often patients present with uh, uh, intestinal obstruction. They often present with stroke. They often present with this is encephalopathy from diffuse microangiopathy. Um, but I said it's named after uh, a Turkish dermatologist in Turkey. And in fact, it's so common in Turkey and in the Mediterranean that in Turkey they call uveitis clinics. Um, uh, a uh, French gentleman of Greek origin also described the disease around the time, at the same time, so they call it a man but just disease in, in much of Europe. Uh, the Japanese guy got no credit for it. Uh, but the triad of symptoms that's classically described is recurrent intraocular inflammation, oral mucosal ulcers, and skin lesions. Now it's interesting when you look at the genetic component of this disease, it's common along the old silk group. A lot of trade in that area, so you have genetic dissemination. And interestingly, in Northern Europe, in, in much of Germany, you have patients with the chest disease who cannot, uh, from, from whom you cannot elicit any history of, um, of silk root or Mediterranean ancestry. But it turns out that in the 1300s, uh, the Turks, invaded all the way up into Northern Europe with, you know, and to, uh, with rape and village emphasis of rape. And you ended up with a lot of genetic dissemination with the likely up in uh, Northern Europe. And so you'll have a lot of patients, even though you won't find evidence of um, silk crude ancestry, you can have some patients because, and it just speaks to how, um, you know, a, a, a true genetic history can never really be elicited. Um, in the Asian phenotype, uh, so I'm talking East Asian, uh, in Japan and in China and in Vietnam, you'll find a high association with the HLA-B51. Uh, haplotype, however, that's not always the case. So in the European variant, you won't find that. Doing an HLA B5 or B51 is not really useful for the diagnosis of HSC at all. Uh, 
but they last for your course, so I make HLA B51 and B5. Uh, I never tested for that. 97% of patients will have oral ulcers, genital ulcers, and those who are skin lesions. Um, who knows what the vegetine reaction is? So, sorry. You stick a needle just just rub it in their skin, and if it has a reaction, it will create a blister. So you see this vesicular eruption in the track of the needle. So you have patients coming in with a kind of dermographic rash, but anytime they get uh, an abrasion, they'll get these vesicles around. So that's something that you see very commonly in, uh, in bed test disease. Ocular inflammation is almost a hallmark of this disease, almost 80%. It's more common in males and females. So the ACR has a criteria for diagnosis, uh, recurrent. The major criteria include the ulcers, the oral mucosa, the skin lesions, everything in the dose of acne. Um, Cutaneous hypersensitivity, the vegetarian reaction. Um, genital ulcers, ocular inflammatory disease. Sorry about the spelling here. Artocytitis and retinitis. You can't see that, but most commonly in occlusive vasculitis of the retina. Minor criteria do include arthritis, intestinal ulcers, usually of an ischemic nature, obliterative vascular disease, and neuropsychiatric symptoms, including encephalopathy or diffuse encephalopathy. Uh, so in order to have complete bed test disease, you need to have four of the main, all four of the major symptoms. Incomplete, three major symptoms, or ocular symptom with one other major uh, symptom. Uh, all of this uh, ocular disease most commonly manifests two to three years after systemic disease. If you ask a review of systems, patients will say that they usually, they will usually say that they've already had red, uh, Genital ulcers that have resolved, oral abscess uh, ulcers that have resolved or are ongoing. Uh, less than a third of patients actually initially present with ocular disease, and most of those patients, if you elicit a history, will tell you about certain symptoms that they have thought nothing of. There's significant vision loss in three years in the vast majority of bilateral disease. And the interesting thing about the chest disease is that it's this recurrent explosive inflammation. So patients will go years or months without any occlusive vasculitis and then suddenly have a flare. So a lot of people are kind of drawn into this false sense of security because this patient has not had any flares in a year off immunosuppressive therapy. But when you look at it, um, they have these huge sudden flares, sometimes brought on by pregnancy, by stress, by, uh, by psychic or physical uh, stress. Um, and we actually studied a bunch of these patients in, in San Francisco. We had them on Remicade, and we took them off Remicade. They had a median time to relapse of 2.3 years, um, as opposed to your uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis patients who recurred almost immediately 2.7 years. Um, so it just is this waxing and waning vision. We won't go through this, but just remember that it is a occlusive uh, angiopathy, either of the small arterioles or the large arterioles. It's normally arterial. Uh, there is some uh, venous um, involvement, but that is rare. Macular ischemia is the most common cause of blindness or non-reversible blindness. There is optic atrophy, uh, vitreous hemorrhage, and very rarely tractional retinal detachment. I have a question. When they get their retinal vasculitis, is it also with like vitritis and anterior segment inflammation, or can it be like asymptomatic and they don't know they're having Usually it? it's with, I mean, classic is described as a retinal vasculitis in the presence of the explosive uveitis, uh, and it is thought to be one of the causes of uh, hypopia on uveitis. What are the others? You know, endophthalmitis, uh, always think of that first when you see a hypopia. Uh, you have um, HLA-B27 disease, and you have a chest disease. Those are the ones that you really want to think about. Uh, 
in saliva cases, necrotizing leukocytoplastic monocytic obliterative vasculitis and affects both the arteries and veins, but it's primarily an arteritis. Um, there's infiltration of neutrophils when it's an active inflammatory process, and uh, there is a process of remission. So, uh, corticosteroids do work, uh, and they work really well. Colchicine was thought to be useful for systemic disease. I don't use it because it's useless. Uh, cyclosporin was uh, uh, useful in uh, in kind of so in association with an anti-metabolite. Anti-metabolites alone rarely work. Anti-cytokine therapy and DNF agents. There's a rare drug exception for the use of uh, Humira or adalimumab and infliximab in bitch chest disease, um, and it works the best in general for retinal vasculitis. Um, uh, anti-cytokine therapy, anti-TNF agents tend to work the best. Interferon has been used, but to make the patients feel awful. And in very, very, very uh, reticent disease, you can use cytotoxic agents, especially when there is evidence of inflammatory encephalopathy, because these patients can die from stroke. Um, so that's what it is in a nutshell. Um, other occlusive vasculitis, this is a patient that my, my colleague in, uh, uh, in Kenya at the time uh, saw. He's an 11-year-old, comes in with severe vision loss and no other symptoms, was positive for uh, ANCA. This is his retinal circulation. Uh, and look at this huge shunt vessel here. So this is an occlusive vasculitis. GPA or wetness can cause an occlusive vasculitis. And we'll discuss this more, uh, I think, next month when we have our scleritis and scleritis lecture. But that's the most common manifestation of retinal vasculitis can happen. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, another patient, this is, these are some cases that I got from a colleague of mine, Pati Baba. Uh, he's been practicing retina for 35 years. 25-year-old uh, white male with onset of blurry vision floaters, diagnosed with iritis, treated with 4K, three plus cells in, um, in the AC, two plus cells in the vitreous, has its multifocal retinitis and hemorrhagic vasculitis. What do you see? <coughs> Once again, film photography, sorry, please. Um, it looks like Inferiorly there, there's some kind of some hemorrhage, <coughs> and then I'm not sure if that's just camera artifact or that's retinal widening out. Right. Um, there's some white spots that, that looks like it's nasal to the disc, so maybe ischemic retinal here, or chronic. So review systems, malaise, myalgia, fever, chills, spot source, testicular pain. Um, looks. So it's got a really high white count. What else? Oh, uh, so uh, everything looks pretty good, except if the ESR is pretty high. So he had an epididymal biopsy, and it was seen to develop this lesion. Where is it? Oh, I'm not supposed to put it here. So, Dara. Uh, I know you're not a foot dog. I'm not a foot dog. I don't know. Is it like? Okay, that's a foot. <laughs> <laughs> is it erythema nodosum? It's a nodule. Okay. okay. On the skin, what do you do when you see a nodule? You biopsy. Right. So what do you see here? This is a blood vessel. Look at the tunica intima and the media, and even the and the whole area. Uh, what's those little blue things? So this is lymphocytic infiltration of the entire vascular wall, no granulomas, and you have an occlusive vasculopathy with skin nodules, high ESR, high white count, and uh, lymphocytic infiltration within blood vessels. So nodule, 
inclusive as providers, i.e. as some of anybody? Nico. Alright, so this is a new waiver polyard right in the middle. So this is actually a pretty uncommon but devastating disease. People die pretty quickly. Uh, you can treat this with cyclophosphamide, and that's how serious it is. It is like yeah, it is like an anchor positive vasculitis. Only anchor is rarely positive. Uh, cyclophosphamide was the treatment of the day back in the 80s, but now we like to make rituximab for this disease because it's a lot kinder and gentler. Uh, it was first described in 1866 by Cosmo. What's he? Had, what else is he famous for? Cosmo respiration. Small. Yeah, because small breathing, right? So, anyway, when you get uh, metabolic acidosis, right? Uh, uh, uncommon disease, four to nine per million patients. It's the most common, uh, it's most common in the fourth to fifth decade, it's most, more common in men. And then 80 to 90% five year mortality. So, this is probably a more severe disease than, than GPA. You get necrotizing vasculitis without granulomatosis. That's what differentiates it from Wagner's and of course the skin lesions. Affects any organ system, and it's a subacute disease presenting over weeks to months. You get abdominal pain, renal disease, um, and you get this polyneuropathy, you get uh, kind of this myositis. Uh, there are two different Varieties as a macroscopic and the microscopic polyangitis is thought to be an immune complex mediated disease, although there is sign, there are signs of uh, primary endotheliitis. Uh, you get aneurysmal dilatation of vessel secretory thrombosis. Thirty to seventy percent have uh, hepatitis B. So there is an association with Hep B. Other viruses that have been associated do include HIV. CMV, hepatitis A, hepatitis C, parvovirus, and HDLV. Uh, there is an association with focal segmental glomerulonephritis, so do a urine urinalysis, pulmonary disease, there's nasopharyngeal disease with collapse of the nasal bridge, uh, loss of the septum. Uh, it's diagnosed both clinically and histologically. Unfortunately, Cianca and Bianca do not really do the trick. Uh, there is an elevated ESR, an elevated CRP, there's vascular inflammation in 86%, uh, and that, that's testicular, uh, and it can even be without symptoms. This patient did come in with testicular pain. Um, uh, testicular biopsy is not favored. <laughs> However, uh, you know, skin, skin biopsies are often useful as are nasal mucosal biopsies. So what do you mean microscopic volume? Like that it's higher microscopic volume? So uh, generally the smaller arterioles, um, it's a pre-capillary blood center. Like so, if there's, so if there's a skin lesion? Then? So uh, you'll, you'll see if you do a biopsy of the nodule, it's usually the tiny, tiny, the tiniest of arterioles that are affected, which is why it's a necrotizing disease. So like on like, you would do it on his So if you have a microscopic, as, a, as opposed to a macroscopic polyangitis, you're more likely to have a higher anchor and the anchor. Uh, once again, this is a clinical diagnosis. This is a uh, pathological and clinically uh, oriented diagnosis. Uh, testing is often negative. Three-fourths of patients have renal disease, uh, and it is the primary cause of death in polyarthritis. Uh, the second most leading cause of this, uh, death is uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, one fifth to one half of patients have skin findings, and about a third have some gastrointestinal disease who ask for a colonoscopy and an upper GI series. Uh, you can have a non deforming arthritis and an arthralgia. So it, Kind of like the arthralgias that you see in lupus, which is also a non deforming arthritis. You can have peripheral nervous system uh, disease, MS like features, paresthesias, and 
uh, genital urinary disease. Ocular manifestations occur in 10 to 20% in every tissue of the eye. You can have vascular inflammation of the epistural, scleral, and lumbar vessels. This is the most common feature. However, you can also see uh, iritis and neuro-ophthalmological manifestations, retinal vasculitis, vitritis, choroidal vascular, uh, vasculitis with choroidal multilobular infarcts, and exudative retinal detachment, as you see in any choroidal disease, kind of a posterior scleritis like picture, but when you do an FA, you'll see multilobular serous retinal detachment. Cyclophosphamide, corticosteroids, rituximab are useful. Uh, ESR can be followed to indicate activity. Untreated, there's a 13% five-year survival. With steroids alone, there's a 48% five-year survival. And if you use a combination regimen, then this data is from the pre rituximab days. Uh, there's a five-year survival rate uh, of 80 to 96%. Microscopic polyantitis, which is predominantly microscopic, uh, it's less likely, uh, it's more likely to kill you uh, with treatment. So this is 60% five-year survival with treatment. This is in the cyclophosphamide days. Once again, it's a change with rituximab and infliximab. We don't really have much data on it right now. Questions about BAN? Uh, this is a 30 year old Asian lady with progressive biological visual loss for 20 days, resistant to uh, medical therapy. This is the fundus examination at presentation. Dara, what do you see? So, uh it looks like the media is, there's maybe some haziness peripherally. It's a bad photo. Uh, and then there is uh, like all these hypopigmented dots. Spots, spots. Spots. You see that in the other eye as well, so loss of vision. Uh, you have some, some leakage of the blood vessels, some occlusion out in the peripheral arterioles and venules, so in the watershed zone. Um, and just as a clueless patient who had been diagnosed with SLE three months earlier um, and has been on IV methylprednisolone for rheumatology and general medicine, prednisone 16 mg daily, and has been on plaquenil, which is like MNM in rheumatology. Um, so Lucas is treated with NSAIDs, antimalarials, corticosteroids, steroids varying agents. Plasmapheresis, dialysis, transplantation. Um, and these days, very much with uh, immunomodulatory therapy, uh, we recommended plasmapheresis and IMT. So it's a wide range, wide ranging disease. There's many presentations, there's increased B cell presentation, de de uh, depressed uh, CD17, sorry, uh, uh, D17, D helper 17 production. So these are the uh, suppressor <coughs> or modulated T cells. Immune complex deposition, antiphospholipid antibodies. Uh, it's a chronic disease, has multi system involvement. Patients generally present with polyarthralgias, polyarthritis, skin lesions. What are the common skin lesions in lupus? Malarage, discoid lesions. Uh, photosensitivity lesions. Uh, renal disease is a killer. Pericarditis, adenopathy, uh, other particular endothelial manifestations such as phenomenally, uh, anemia, neurological disorders, and ocular findings. Oh, that's back. It has a 20 year survival rate, that's pretty good. Age of onset is between 20 and 50, mean age is 30, women more than men, black more than white. However, uh, you do see uh, a certain subtype in Scandinavians. Uh, there's a prevalence of one in 2100, so it's actually one of the more common uh, inflammatory diseases. So the ACR, the American College of Rheumatology, has a revised criteria for the classification of SLE. 
Uh, malar rash, discoid rash, photosensitivity rash are the skin manifestations of oral ulcerative arthritis, serositis. Renal disorders, most common cause of death, neurological disorders uh, such as microangiopathies and encephalopathy. Uh, hematological disorders, so you can't have anemia. Um, immunologic disorders, I don't know what that's there, sorry, anti nuclear antibody. Uh, is one of the revised criteria for SLE. Uh, for, to have a definitive diagnosis, you need four of 11 ACR criteria. Ocular lesions are not one of the 11 criteria. Um, so ANA has a 95% sensitivity, and it's really one of the only uh, ocular inflammatory diseases where ANA is useful, because you can follow it as you immunosuppressive patient. Anti-DSDNA has a pretty high sense of specificity. Uh, Anti-Rho, anti la uh, lupus anticoagulant, anti-cardiolipin antibody in the case of uh, uh, obstetric disease, so multiple uh, spontaneous abortions, and in the case of um, hypercoagulable disease such as uh, uh, venous stasis disease. Retinal findings do parallel systemic disease. Uh, and geography shows arterial and capillary non-confusion, staining of blood vessels, cotton wool spots, CRAOs and CRVOs, retinal and vitreous hemorrhage. Similar findings as in hypertensive retinopathy with uh, Choroidal microinfarctions, retinal microinfarctions, nerve fiber microinfarctions, which are cotton wool spots. Uh, retinal neovascularization can occur due to extensive ischemia. You can get serious retinal detachments of a more focal variety, not multilocular, and you can get tractional retinal detachments. Remember that this is more of a micro uh, of a retinal angiopathy, not so much a retinal. Vasculitis. Uh, it is uh, probably brought on by diffuse endothelial damage. Somebody had a question? I was going to say, you, you see it, so I guess you see it more in arteries versus the veins then? It's mixed. Mixed. But it's, a, it's usually it's a micro angio. It's, yeah. it's usually in the very, very small vessels in the capillary vessels, like in the arterioles and in the small venules. All right. Here's a 28 year old lady with a one month history of recurrent episodes of vertigo, hearing loss, and increased confusion. Sorry, to go back to that one. So, would there be no detritus because it's like an angiopathy rather than Almost itis? Never. Almost never. I mean, it's, it's an itis, <laughs> but it's, uh, um, it's more of an endotheliitis. Uh, it, the, the Why though? <laughs> <laughs> Um, the, it, it, there's not much immune complex composition in uh, endovisits. Often, um, the antibodies are often targeted against uh, endothelial cell surface proteins, anti cardiolipin, anti phospholipid. Uh, you get small amounts of obliteration of the very small blood vessels. It's an endotheliitis. Um, there are cases where you can get scleritis, where you can get some vitritis, but by and large, this is more of a microangiopathy. Remember the patients, since this is not a very uh, aggressive in inflammatory disease, you, patients will often not present with uh, ocular inflammatory disease. They'll often present with other findings, and you'll see you know, cotton wool spots on, uh, on screening visits. Um, or on routine eye exam. Sometimes they present with uh, with uh, microangiopathy, and sometimes they'll present with uh, hypertensive retinopathy or choroidopathy. And that's actually probably the most common uh, uh, cause of vision loss and lupus over the occlusive vasculopathy. It's usually you know, patients come in with uncontrolled hypertension from their renal disease. And, 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 and that's why they have vision loss. Uh, not so much the 
the rest of my life in jail. Anyway, where were we? All right, this will speak to all of you. <laughs> so neurology, consulted ophthalmology because this lady comes in with a one month history of recurrent episodes of vertigo, hearing loss, increased confusion. I think somebody will recognize this patient. It was you, Reese. Okay. Two, I think. Anyway, everybody knows what it is. So when she was first seen, she had some loss of vision and gone ready. So left eye, there's a couple of cotton wool spots or retinal whitening, I guess. And then kind so of it's a very large cotton wool spot because the well, they're in the central, area. right? Yeah. Right. With a larger cotton wool spot there. Which is what it is. What's it? Right. What's the CREO? A huge cotton wool right. spot. It's true. Not wrong. Uh, what do you see here? Uh, so there's a blurration of that superior arcade. Right. Uh, it's arcade. Yeah. Six months later, comes in with this vision. So a couple of large cotton wool spots in both eyes. And geography? Uh, so there's some vascular sheathing there on the inferior arcade. Not sheathing, just a little bit of leakage. Oh, leakage, okay, yeah. Uh, then I think that's the same vessel from earlier. With, it's completely obliterated there. Yeah. Yeah. What do you see here? Uh, then there's some leakage there peripherally. And then maybe some disc leakage as well. Uh, and a completely uninvolved site over here. Right. Some, something that you didn't see in the <coughs> Yeah. What do you see here? Uh, some multiple enhancing lesions within, looks like the pawns. No, not pawns, no. No, sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, of the, what? Yeah, corpus callosum. Yeah, so you see. And, but there's also, no, I guess the enhancing lesions I was referring to are actually of the, the. So, D1 flare, D1, right? Where CSF is dark? No, T2 is CSF dark. Warner would kill me. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, so you see colossal hypointensity, and on flare, you see these non contiguous uh, enhancements of the corpus callosum. It's a little easier. This is a sizable flare D2. Those are enhancements. So also enhancements. Not enhancements because there's no. Uh, yeah, there's no contrast. There's no contrast, but uh, so uh, hyper intensity. Hyper yeah, hyper flare intensity. signal amplifiers. Signal amplifiers. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> together we can all be one hero. <laughs> so, diagnosis. Everybody knows this. Once again, another disease where there are probably more papers than patients, but uh, so sex disease is an important one for you to know because they like to test it and because uh, neurology consults you guys on this pretty topic. So, uh, initiated treatment with IVIG infusions and CELSEF. So SACS is a triad of, triad of encephalopathy, hearing loss and multiple DRAOs. Women more than men, three is to one. Age of onset is nine to 58, but averages around the, in the 30s. Multiple areas of CNS microinfarction with colossal and very colossal white matter changes. A procoagulant state has not been demonstrated, even though this is a microangiopathy. There is elevation of factor eight and uh, anti one filibrand factor antigen that's thought to represent endothelial damage. Brain biopsy shows multiple areas of microinfarction, endothelial injury, typical of an endo anti endothelial anti-endothelial cell injury syndrome. However, the antigen has not been identified. Treatment, steroids work initially, alkylating agents, IV, IG. Aspirin is a useful adjunct. Uh, all therapies have variable efficacy. Most patients tend to improve spontaneously with or without treatment, although treatment is advocated. And, uh, some patients do progress to dementia, uh, irreversible global encephalopathy. So, just a 
quick summary, we have two minutes. Uh, there are certain clinical entities that are associated with a retinal vasculitis, the systemic vasculitis, some of which have been discussed, some of which have not. Polyarthritis nodosa, Wagner's, George Strauss, uh, lymph lymphoid granulomatosis, which uh, does include uh, uh, GPA, but can include uh, isolated granulomatosis. Hypersensitivity vasculitis, SUSAC, uh, giant cell arthritis, temporal and acryasis. Other clinical entities do include all of these. Uh, sarcoidosis is probably one of the most common. Uh, you can have an, uh, some patients with ankylosing spondylitis, HLAB27 positive, with retinal vasculitis, Crohn's disease, uh, polymyositis, bacteriasis, GCA, lymphoma and leukemia can give you masquerade-like syndrome. Certain infectious diseases, certainly HSV, BZV, CMV are all viral um, retinitis. This is whose primary lesion is a vasculitis. HSV um, iritis is a vasculitis of the iris. HSV uh, BCD sclerokeratitis is a vasculitis of those structures. And ARN is a vasculitis that's viral with massive perivascular infiltration. So that's why we use steroids. There are isolated retinal vasculitis, eels, ARN, toxoplasmosis can cause a retinal vasculitis. And of course, not to forget the most common cause of retinal vasculitis, which is none at all or idiopathic retinal vasculitis. It's important to ask about the epidemiological aspects. Race, uh, ethnicity, place of birth, um, you know, uh, and, and, and that can help you maybe narrow some things down. But just disease, for instance. Comprehensive history, do ask about every system in the body. How would you know about testicular lesions unless you ask about them? Clinical features on ocular examination. Do look at the cornea. It's because you're in the retina surface. Doesn't mean you don't look at the cornea. UVIs, is there inflammation? Sometimes you really have to look for it. Make a patient look up and down so that you can perturb the vitreous and actually see cells come up at you. Scleritis, is there focal, segmental, or diffuse scleritis? And then look at the pattern of retinal vasculitis. Is it arterial, venous, or both? That can give you some clues. Laboratory testing, this is an area where we run into trouble. This is what's recommended. The things in red are what I would uh, think about uh, to begin with. Um, definitely a CBC. ESR and CRP are important vascular markers because if you see a patient with retinal vasculitis and a high ESR, then you're thinking systemic vasculitis. ANA, ANCA, anti DNA, cryoglobulins in the setting of hepatitis B. C. Cryoglobinemic vasculitis does affect the retina. Uh, therefore, it's important to check for the viral hepatitis syndromes. Uh, of course, always check for syphilis, always check for HIV in these particular patients. All the rest are not really useful. Do an ultrasound. Look at the evidence of choroidal pinning. Fluorescein angiography is, of course, uh, a chest a CT scan of the chest and an MRI can be useful, but use it only sparingly when you have uh, evidence of systemic uh, symptoms. Tissue biopsy is always the answer if you see lesions on the skin. Yes? If you have a idiopathic retinal vasculitis, how far in review systems is negative? I tend not to do so you too don't. much more. Yeah, okay. Um, if you have you have to look at the clinical signs and, and then decide this or that. So if you have a lady who comes in with multiple branch retinal vein and artery occlusions with uh, encephalopathy and right. then, okay, fine. But if you don't have any positive in the review system, I tend to be a little bit cautious do when the, ordering an MRI. Do the idiopathic retinal vasculitis, do you treat it? How do you usually treat that? Do 
start with steroids, think okay. about methotrexate, so think you, about, okay, uh, I use the same step ladder, but I have a much lower threshold to start uh, a biologic. Okay. Because biologics and idiopathic retinal vasculitis anecdotally tend to work a lot better than the demon double okay. um, Of course, if you see anything to biopsy, do biopsy it. <laughs> That's important. Um, so, retinal vasculitis is inflammatory disease of retinal vessels associated with intraocular inflammation. It's rarely, sorry, it's usually idiopathic. I don't know why that came in. Associated with, it's usually idiopathic. It, uh, and when you're, you're talking about idiopathic, uh, let's just say it's rarely associated with systemic disease. It's often idiopathic, but it's often associated with ocular specific or isolated ocular syndrome. Um, systemic workup is warranted because the diseases that it is associated with are very, very dangerous. Lupus can kill you. Uh, uh, BAN can certainly kill you. Jerk strokes can kill you. Uh, uh, GPA can kill you. Do rule out infectious etiologies. Very important. Use systemic corticosteroids, liberally perioculative steroids, really are indicated because often these are bilateral diseases. Systemic immunosuppressive therapy is uh, always useful, except in certain cases such as Ehlers disease, where we know it does not work. In urban, it doesn't really work that well either. It's important to address the consequences of retinal vascular occlusion, just like with any other retinal vascular occlusive disease with laser decrease the VEGF flow. Vitrectomy uh, can be useful to rule out infectious disease, but more importantly, it's used to clear up vitreous opacity and uh, vitreous hemorrhage. So it's an uncommon ophthalmologic condition with profound effects of visual acuity. Uh, it can indicate the worsening of existing systemic disease or be a herald for an unidentified systemic disease and it often requires aggressive systemic therapy. Uh, always look for it, always think about it, and then always think about potential systemic disease questions.